Ephesians chapter 6 is where we're at. Ephesians 6. Recall, last week we spent the whole service talking about the enemy, the foe. We talked about Satan. We talked about his wiles. Did we not remember that? Satan's going to try to get us to have doubts, right? Doubt, doubts about God's word, doubts about uh, God's judgment, doubts about God's goodness. And we concluded last week that if Satan can get us doubting God, then he's one step closer to get us to disobey God. From doubts to disobedience. That was the pattern in Eve's life. That's the pattern really in all the Bible. If people start to doubt what the Bible says, doubt what God says, then they go into sin. Today, we're going to look at how we can defend ourselves. Defend ourselves against these wiles of the devil. And truly, what we see today is not just what we'll need to survive this life, but really to thrive as soldiers for the Lord. I mean, active members on this battlefield of life and spiritual warfare. What will we need to be effective? What will we need to stay standing? Verse 10 begins this conversation. Ephesians 6 and verse 10. It says, Finally, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. First thing we're going to need in this battle called life, this spiritual battle in the Christian's life, is strength. We're going to need strength to get through this life and to serve the Lord but not just any old strength. Look at that verse. It says, the power of His, the power of His might. You see that? Sometimes as Christians, I think we think that we've got to be strong enough ourselves. And about the time we think that it's about our strength is where we're going to fail. We're going to realize our strength is depleted. Our strength is we're getting wearing out. We're tired out. Can't go anymore. People who get burnt out, in serving the Lord. I mean, I can relate. I I love you. I understand. But people who say they're burnt out in serving the Lord, they were relying too much on their own strength. Too much. It was too much about them. I'm going to make this work one more day. I'm going to make this work one more service. That's how you burn out is thinking it's about you. God has given me in recent years, my, my health is not perfect. I can't complain. But more and more God has me relying on His strength. On His strength. And in many ways, it's, it's very helpful. I don't need enough strength to stand behind the pulpit or serve the Lord at church or outside of church. I need God's strength. Psalm 33, 16 says, There is no king save by the multitude of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. You are not going to be the mother. You're supposed to be through your strength, the church member, the witness, the pastor, the teacher, Sunday school teacher, whatever it is. You're not going to make it on your strength. You don't have enough. You don't have enough. It's not good enough. Those things aren't fun to say, are they? But your strength is not good enough. My strength is not good enough. It may be enough to, to power through a couple weeks, a couple years, Maybe keep powering through, just playing the game. But we've got to, in our lives, learn that we've got to lean on God's strength. Isaiah 40, verse 31 at camp. We're going to be looking at this passage in detail, but let me read it for you. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40 speaks of some incredible strength. Some incredible strength. They're going to mount up with wings as eagles. What's the key, though, there? It says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Waiting on the Lord. I was thinking about that, kind of how we all have these cell phones today, and we're always charging them, aren't we? Well, if you charge your cell phone for about five seconds, how much power do you get? About five seconds worth of power. It's not going to last long. I think sometimes of going to God and going to God and waiting on God. I'm not saying it's a direct correlation of time, but if you're going to God as a five-second prayer, right, during the week, that's about how much recharge you're going to be. You have about that much strength. You need to spend some time with the Lord. In our hymnals, these good old songs, there's that song, Sweet Hour of Prayer. Boy, if you were to get an hour of prayer, that's an hour of recharging, of renewing. 
You know, if we take advantage of a good Sunday, we get in here and enjoy a couple good hours of studying God's Word. We can get recharged. But friends, it's got to happen daily. You can't, you can't go, you couldn't go every day not plugging your cell phone in, could you? Every day, you've got to have some walk with the Lord. Got to get your Bibles open, recharge. You're, you're not going to have strength to do His work. You might have enough strength to drag your weary bones around and do what you want to do, but you're not going to have the strength to go witness to your friend like you're supposed to, to go be the spiritual mom or dad or husband or wife or grandma or grandpa that you're supposed to be. You're not going to have the spiritual muster there. You need to wait on the Lord to renew your strength. If you lack strength today, and I'm not just talking about our bones being weary. I'm talking about spiritual fervor. Sometimes the spiritual zeal we need to go the extra mile to teach our kids what's right or what's wrong. The spiritual zeal we need to work out a relationship, maybe with a brother or sister or, or even a spouse. Take some spiritual zeal, some fervor. You're going to get that by going to God. Low on strength, you need to recharge. Got to wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. This is the first part. Just a small part of the sermon, but talks about be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Are you weak spiritually? Recharge with God. We can, we, can, we, can, we can charge right now in this moment. These 45 minutes remaining, we can recharge. Let that be a goal for us. Look at 11. Here's where the sermon really takes off as far as uh, the structure of it goes. 11. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You know, the Bible uses metaphor all over the place. It uses for the Christian life, it uses the idea of a race, a marathon, but it often uses the metaphor of battle, soldiers, warfare. Because it is warfare. There is an enemy. There is Satan. You're going to talk about some of this, the enemy right in verse 12, but there is a battle going on. There is a lot at stake. There are souls. There are souls at stake. There are right now, there are young people being taught absolute lies, absolute lies that are going to destroy their lives right at the onset. They're young people. And you've got some people now before they're 10 being already brainwashed so much that they're destroying themselves and their bodies. And forget about when they're teenagers, they're hearing so many lies, their lives are going off in so many pitfalls just right from the beginning. And God loves these kids, absolutely loves these kids. We should love these kids. But this world is filled with very hateful, malicious lies, attacks. Many are falling, homes are crumbling. Falling apart. People we love, their marriages aren't lasting. Some of us are fortunate to enjoy some years of marriage together. Well, count yourself lucky. Your neighbor's probably not experiencing that or they won't be next year. The devil's attacks are vicious. He's bringing people down. There's a battle right now. And above it all, what he wants to do is make sure that people never accept Christ as their Savior. He's convincing them that their sin's not that big a deal. The punishment of hell is not so bad. And the Savior, maybe he's one of many ways to redeem yourself. No, he's the only way. The blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, is the only way of salvation. That point alone, fighting for the truth of the gospel, is a battle enough for our entire lives. Fighting for the truth of the gospel is enough for you to say, I need to be strong. I need to wake up today and I need to fight for that. I need to make sure I, I get the truth out there and I need to swat away some lies. It's important to understand the metaphor of the battle because if you approach this text as, you know, pastor preached a sermon about putting on some armor and if you do or you don't, no big deal. No, it's the difference between you falling on your face in this life or not. The difference between you being vulnerable and you going down from the devil's attacks. And if you go down, good luck with the rest of your home. If you go down, good luck in your church. You go down, what about the community? If everybody falls on this battlefield, the devil wins. I mean, he's not going to win overall. God wins overall. We know that. But in the meanwhile, the devil's having victories in little skirmishes all over this world. If you're not there dressed appropriately with the right mindset, you're not helping. You're not helping. Levin tells us, how to dress appropriately for this battle. It says, put on the whole armor. There are a couple key words here. Look at that word, or the two words, put on. Put on. That's an action. 
That's the Bible telling you to do this. That means it doesn't come automatically. I explained to our kids in the opening, I explained in our opening that salvation is automatic. You, you ask Christ to be your Savior and you believe in Christ in your heart. That's automatic. Boom. You are then made a, you are a child of God. You're sealed into the day of redemption. You are saved. No one can take that away from you. Okay? But this idea of putting on the armor of God, it's not automatic. You don't have this armor every day. It's something that you need to decide to do. I'm going to put on this armor and march into this battlefield called the Christian life. It's active. If you haven't thought about this concept for a while, it could be you've been walking around without any armor on. You've been walking around vulnerable to the devil's attacks, to his tricks, to his lies. Think about that, please, because this is an active pursuit. This is, this, is, this is your prayer life. This is you going to God saying, God, arm me up for the day. This is your Bible reading, God, to help me know where the attacks are going to come, how to protect myself, my kids, the ones I love. The other word I'd bring you to is whole. Put on the whole armor. That leads me to believe that you can be partially armored in this life. I mean, you can have a, a, a killer, right? Uh, I don't know, some killer boots protected well at your feet, but you, you, your whole upper torso is completely vulnerable. Think about that soldier on the battlefield. It wouldn't do much good to walk onto the battlefield with the best helmet in the world, but have no armor for your complete upper, right? Your chest and all these vital organs. It'd make no sense, would it? There's this idea of the whole arm. We're going to describe the whole armor, but you got to know what it is. You got to apply it all, or you'll be vulnerable to attack. The wiles of the devil, that's what we spoke about last, last week. That means the devil's not going to fight fair. That means he's going to do sneak attacks, ambush attacks. That means he's going to aim for what's most vulnerable in your life. Where are you missing armor? That's where he's going to hit you. Where are your kids missing armor? That's where he's going to hit them. He'll find your weaknesses. He will. He's seen a thousand of you, a million of you, like we preached last week. He knows how to bring you down. But God says we can have the armor to stand. Look at verse 12. 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. At no point in the sermon do I want you to believe that I'm speaking of physical violence or actually, uh, you know, physical combat. This is talking about spiritual warfare, which is actually a lot more destructive. You know, the, the devil could attack you with some mean, vicious dog, but the most it's going to do is bite your leg. Okay, but if the devil attacks you with a lie, it could bring your whole house down. Ruin your faith. Ruin a church. Ruin your role in a church. Spiritual wickedness in high places. The devil's the mastermind, but he has. He has forces, demons in this world. He has people filled with the devil. He has people that have believed the devil's lies, and now they're running with his lies. We've got to be armored. Look at verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. What's the goal here in Christianity? What's the goal? To stand. To stand. This is the text here. That the, our job as Christians is to stand. Is to not succumb. You say, well, that sounds easy. It's not many mighty men around us falling. There are many, many Christians who have succumbed to the devil's attacks. And they might not even be aware of it, but their life proves it. They're not in the battlefield for Christ. They're not sharing his truth. The last time they witnessed to somebody was 1972. That means you've fallen. Not raised in godly homes. Their mind's on other things. Their mind's not on the next generations having faith. The next generations being the preachers and teachers and moms and dads of spiritual salt. They've fallen. That's what fallen looks like. The goal is to still be standing as a Christian. Still be on the battlefield. 
as a Christian. I want to show you some examples that hopefully will bring this out. But if you hold a hand in Ephesians, I want to turn over here right across the page to Colossians. It's a couple books to your right. Just a few pages. Colossians chapter 4. Standing. Because I want us to get some tangible idea of why are we armoring up? What does this mean to stand? I'll show you what it means. Look at Colossians 4. Let's look at verse 7. We'll see some people who are standing. Colossians 4, 7. All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. Now, Tychicus, he's standing. He's still serving the Lord with his life. He hadn't gone anywhere else. He's right there sharing the gospel right alongside Paul. Minister, he's a servant in this work. Look at 8. Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. Tychicus is serving the Lord. Paul said it to other people to make sure they're serving the Lord. Are they still standing? Are they still serving? He's going to comfort them. He's going to encourage them to stand, serve God. Look at 9. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother. Now, Onesimus, he's standing. He's in this list of people standing. Who is one of you? They shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, verse 10 says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you. And Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye receive commandments. If he come unto you, receive him. Naming people who are still standing in this battlefield. And Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of my, who are of the circumcision. These only are my fellow workers under the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. He says it kind of in a way that there should be more, doesn't he? These only. And he's named about four, four, four guys now. This is these only. I will be completely honest with you. In my life, the Bible tells us in all things to be content. And I strive to be content. One area I do struggle is that I do believe, and I love this church. I love every person here. I think we've got a great, God's really opened doors. It's been wonderful growing together. But I was telling our deaconess the other day, I do believe there are supposed to be more laborers in this church. I'm not trying, we're not trying to grow to a thousand people or 500 people. We're not trying to do anything like that. I'm not trying to, you know, go full time and you know, sit around all week long. That's not what I'm doing. I don't care. I'll, I'll work forever. It doesn't matter to me at all. But I'm just telling you, I believe we are missing some fellow laborers. It's not, we're not, I'm not applauding us like we're the, we're the end all be all. I'm just saying that there are fellow laborers out there. We're supposed to join in. And it could very well be that what's happened to them is they've fallen. Vulnerability's been found by the devil, and the devil got them, brought them down. They're not in the battlefield now. We need more soldiers. And the devil, I mean, God can use one person to do big things. He did it with David against a giant. We know that. I just feel in my heart of hearts that soldiers are missing across this world. And our little valley is indicative of this. This valley is filled with thousands of people. I'm sure there's people serving the Lord in different churches. I'm not saying that's not happening, but I'm saying there are places in the ranks that are empty. People aren't showing up to the battle. It says only. Look at verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you. This guy's standing. Look what it sounds like. Laboring fervently for you in prayers. One way you know he's standing, he's praying. And he's praying for others. He's praying for their work. This guy's aware of the battle. If you were on a battlefield, you'd be praying for yourself, right? Lord, protect me from these arrows flying over my head. Lord, help my brother, sister right next to me. People who pray for other people, people who are in the battle, they understand it. They understand it's not easy to step out and share your faith. It's not. Not in this world. You get laughed at. You get mocked. You get called archaic. You get called a chauvinist. You get called, I don't know what kind of names. You get called a cult leader. If I can remember all the names I've received in my life. Use some arrows at you. This guy's praying that ye may stand perfectly and complete in all the will of God. All the will of God. 
This guy's talking about getting somebody all the way on the battlefield. Right? The battlefield is not something in your life you just kind of, yeah, I do it on the weekend. I go, you know, it's not like one of those reenactment things where you just go, <laughs> which are pretty cool, but you just go reenact some Civil War battle, you know. It's not Christianity. You don't just show up in a costume and do it on the weekends or once a month or every other year, right? You're in there completely. You're on the battlefield. You're there. That's your life. You're wary. The devil doesn't take the week off. We all know this, right? He didn't take the week off. He's not taking Monday off. Who's right there trying to mess you and your family up? Cousins, your friends, your relatives. He's not taking time off. You need to be all in on this thing called the spiritual fight, aware of the wiles of the devil. Look at 13. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. Zeal for you again. This, this is very telling. Tell a lot about whether you're on the battlefield yourself if you have zeal for others in the battles that they're going through. I mean, the spiritual battles. If you're not praying for other Christians and, you know, praying that God would open a door of utterance or praying that they would have a, a victory here, right? Maybe they're struggling with something. Praying for them to have a victory over that attack. Maybe you don't know what the battle really is. Maybe you don't know how vicious the devil's attacks are. We should know, though. All you got to do is look around a little bit and you see how the devil brings things down Swiftly and terribly. People who, who, who build their lives not on the word of God, those houses fall like houses in sinking sand. The devil's right there telling them to build there. And he's happy when they crumble. Look at verse 14. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. He continues on, but remember that verse 14. In particular, remember that word, that name, Demas. 15, salute the brethren which are in Laodicea, Nymphus, and the church which is in his house. Talking about these other brothers and other churches serving the Lord. And when this epistle is read among you, cause it to be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, that you likewise read the epistle from, the, from Laodicea. These people reading Paul's letters were the people that were serving in churches. They got to hear God's word. 17, and they to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. I love these words. I love these words. They paint a picture of what Christian life is, right? Paul's naming all these people. He's got them in his head. He's been praying for them. He knows where they're at. He knows this guy named Archippus. We don't know much about him, but Paul knows that Archippus has received a job from the Lord, and he hasn't finished it yet. But he's praying, I pray that you fulfill it. I pray that you do it. Wonderful, isn't it? Do, you, do we have that today? I, do we have that today? I know that Brother Dan has got a job to do from the Lord. I pray that he, I pray that he fulfills it. I don't know what that is. Maybe as a deacon or as a father or a brother or someone he's witnessing to. But that's deep. That's, that's, a, that's a battlefield mindset. I know this brother's going through and I pray that he fulfills it. All right, this sister over here, this young person over here. If, if, if we had a battlefield mentality, that's how we'd live. Hey, how'd your day go? How'd this day go? How'd that, how'd that battle go today with your faith, with your Lord? All right, with attacks of the devil, how did it go? Spiritually. Remember that word, that name, Demas. Demas. You know, it also says, let me read this one for you. Philemon, verses 23 and 24 says... There salute thee Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. Philemon and Colossians are written around A.D. 64. And in A.D. 64, this man named Demas is called a fellow laborer. He's a soldier right there by Paul. Now please turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. This, this might scare you a little bit. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. Watch this language again. Paul's using, he's, he's teaching Timothy about this Christian life. In 4 7, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now, Paul, he, he's an aged warrior here. He's been on the battlefield nonstop. He said he's fought a good fight. I pray that can be our words at our later days, right? We've fought a good fight. 
8. Henceforth, we're in 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but in all them also that love his appearing. Speaks to this idea of rewards in heaven. This isn't talking about salvation. He's not soldiering to get saved. He's soldiering for spiritual rewards. Think about uh, after big wars, you know, back from World War II, people come back and get the Medal of Honor, right, or the Purple Heart, or whatever award they received, they earned. God's the same way. It's a real battlefield. There will be Christians in heaven. It'll be wonderful to be there if you're there. Wonderful just, just to be there. But there will be Christians, well-decorated Christians. God told us to serve. He rewards faithful servants, faithful soldiers. What kind of Christian will you be? Decorated, undecorated? Having done something for your Lord and Master? I want to, when I show up, I, that's what I want. I want to have it said that Christ gave everything. He shed his blood for me to save my soul. So Logan used his life for the Lord. That's what I, that's what I want it to look like. That's why I want rewards. I don't want it to be. I don't want to stand there before God, right? But yeah, you saved me. The blood of Christ was wonderful. You saved my soul. Praise the Lord. I never told anybody about it because I didn't want it to get too crowded up here. I didn't tell anybody about it because I'm just kind of just in it all for myself. Just worried about my own skin. Right. It would come across that way, wouldn't it? If you got saved yourself, but then you never told anybody about it? Or you never helped other people tell the world about the Savior? That's what it seemed like. He says, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. Look at verse 9. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Now, now 10 is, where, is why we came. Look at 10. For Demas. Remember that guy, Demas? Two years ago, he was serving the Lord. It says, Demas hath forsaken me. He's fallen. Demas is not standing anymore. He's succumbed to the devil's attacks. Doesn't say he's not saved. He, I, he is saved. He was serving right with, with Paul a couple years ago. I believe he was a Christian. But he's forsaken the work now. Why? Look at the next phrase. Having loved this present world. Think about the devil's attacks. Sometimes we think it's going to be vicious. It's going to be rough. Right? He's going to try to get my car to break down and me to lose my job. No, actually, the, the, the devil's attacks might be the opposite. He might give you a wonderful job that consumes every last year of your life where you make all kinds of wonderful money. And money becomes your wonderful treasure. And that's exactly where your heart is at, is with your wonderful money, your wonderful treasure. The devil's attacks are wiles. Remember this. Wiles, tricks, stratagems. People, people get that all messed up, and the prosperity preachers don't help with that either, do they? Right? You, you, know, you, you give some money in the box, then everything's, you're gonna, all your dreams are going to come true. Right? Tithe here, put your money on the water, it's going to come back. Big blessings, big careers, big wonderful things, better health, all this kind of stuff. The devil can reward. The devil was offering to Christ, remember, see all this, I'll give you if you'll bow down and worship me. Demas loves this present world. He succumbed, he succumbed to the temptation of what the devil could offer. I don't know what it was, it doesn't say. But he was right there alongside Paul the Apostle. Pretty good dude. Right there alongside Paul the Apostle serving the Lord. But the devil put something over here in this world and he's like, well, uh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? He chose the world. If Demas can do that to Paul, boy, we can do that today, can't we? We can be serving the Lord and we're like, eh, you know, serving the Lord. Eh. I got this opportunity. I got this other way to live, this other important thing in life. This thing can be a lot of things. People idolize a lot of things in this world. The, the idol can be so big. Family can be this idol that becomes bigger than serving the Lord. Money can become that idol. You know, lust of the flesh, pride in life. These things become bigger than serving the Lord. And we could do a Demas. Forsake the work. Forsake the battlefield. This is what falling looks like. That's what I'm trying to describe. If you looked at Demas, if the average person looked at Demas, they'd probably be like, well, he's still doing just fine. In fact, he got that great job over there in Galilee, and now he's just living it up, living his best life. 
But in God's eyes, he's fallen. He's forsaken the work. Having done all to stand, Demas hadn't done all to stand. I submit to you, probably wasn't wearing all his armor. Loved this present world and has departed into Thessalonica, I should say. Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Like some people leaving the work. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable me, for I have for the ministry. Where does your name fall? Would you be a Luke or a Demas? I'm no Paul, so it's not necessarily about what you do with me, but it's everything about what you do with serving the Lord in your life. I mean, I, I do believe this church for serving the Lord. Having an all to stand. Please go back. No, no, no. Before we do that, let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 10. Let's draw this out a little bit more. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 10. Yeah, this will be good. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 1. We'll talk about the armor. In just a second. Let's talk about the likelihood of falling, the possibility of falling. Maybe you're thinking it's never happened to you, never will happen to you. You are above the devil's attacks. You've seen it before. You've just had a lot of experience. Maybe the devil has convinced you that uh, the love you have for the world is actually admirable. It's not. 1 Corinthians 10, 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Paul, inspired by God here, wants to remind us to not be ignorant about this. This fact that we can have, we can, can have walked with God before and seen what God has done before, but watch too. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and that all eat the same spiritual meat, and that all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Here are all these people marching, all these millions of people right out of Egypt, God's people. They've all seen the same things, had the same experiences, but God's not pleased with them. There are some hearts that are separate from God, that are turning from God, that have fallen in this battle of believers. Look at 6. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. They started loving this world. Boy, they just got out of the world in Egypt, right? They're going to go to the promised land. Oh, that wonderful promised land life. But they started lusting for the things of this world. They started longing for the things back in captive Egypt, where they were slaves. They wanted those things. It says it's an example for our admonition to learn from. You can be a, you can get saved. You absolutely can get born again. Right? You understand that Christ saves and the world's not that important. But it is possible for that saved person then to start looking back. Well, look at my old life. Look at the old way. It was easier, it's better. Had more friends, had more money, had whatever, had more freedom. We start longing. It's possible. That's what this passage is here for. If we to long, you get saved, you get out of the world, then you start just living like the world again. Boy, you do that too much, I start wondering if you ever actually got saved in the first place. But it's possible for believers to start longing for the world again. That's what Demas did. Look at 7. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Idolaters. Idolaters. Something in this world came before God and His will. Serving the Lord. Things that steal your heart. Idolatry. Take your focus. Take your passion, your zeal. And I have many things in this world that I like to do. I have hobbies, I have work, I have interests, and I try to tackle them all with some zeal. But friends, if your zeal, if your passion is, is in this world more than what you have in God, you've got to rebalance. You've got to say, this is just a hobby, this is just a job. 
This is just this. Is just this. It's got to stay down here. Got to beat those things down. When they rise taller than God's work, it's an idol. It's an idol. Look at 8. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Some of these idols that can set up, they can be the sins of the flesh. These fleshly sins can overtake us. Look at nine. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them were all them also some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Here are the, the sins of the flesh. And here I believe some of this tempting Christ, the sins of the eyes. Now look at 10. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Some of these sins of the mind. Our minds are drifting from God. Our thankfulness, our bitterness swells up. Our pride swells up. The devil brings us down like this, like these children in the wilderness. Idols set up, whether idols of the eyes, things you can have and gather, idols of the flesh, things that appease you, or these idols in the mind that destroy us, destroyed of the destroyer. So the devil, that's how it describes the devil here, the destroyer. It says in verse 11, Now all these things happen unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. 12, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You know what the devil does so well is he has this off-ramp plan to get soldiers off the battlefield, and he does it in a way that you get off the battlefield, but you still think you're on the battlefield. I don't know, he, put, he puts a little fake rifle in your hand. He turns on some sound effects. I don't know how he does it, but Christians leave the ranks of serving the Lord, and the devil somehow convinces them, no, I'm, you kidding me, I'm still serving the Lord like crazy. My job, right, I'm just, I'm worshiping the trees out here because the trees need ministered unto. Or I don't know what lie he might tell you. But people retire from the battlefield, which means they're, they're not sharing their faith, they're not standing for truth, but they act like they're still on the battlefield. They're not. They're not. Take heed. It says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Know where you're standing. Are you really on the, are you standing on the battlefield for the Lord? Or is it your own golf course? Nothing against golfing. <laughs> is it your own, uh, I don't know, fishing pier? Nothing against fishing. I love all these things. But friends, in big picture, that's not the battlefield. Look at 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. If you fall off this battlefield from some temptation, something you thought you had to do, don't blame God. He always has, He always gives us the resources, the empowerment we need to stay faithful. If we get unfaithful, it's all on us. The financial one's easy to think about. People say, you know, I just had to stop, had to stop going to church, had to stop focusing on that, had to start focusing on making money or I wasn't going to get by. That's a lie. God doesn't need you to focus on money. He says focus on serving the Lord and all these things should be added unto you. I've met, I've met pastors, and I love good older pastors. You know, they say, well, I just, had to, I just had to hang it up. Too much pressure from the ministry. My health was getting too bad, so I just kind of gave it up, and now I'm in Arizona, you know, retired pastor, no, doing nothing. And I don't mind if God called you to stop pastoring. That's great, but you're not done. You're not done until you're done. You don't hang it up. God will, God is faithful. He will always give you the strength to get beyond that sin, always give you the strength to get beyond that doubt, that necessity. He'll supply it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The reason you fell or might fall, it's not because of God. It's always because you've made some idol. You've put in something above God. It could be the very idol of your happiness. Well, I did the Christian thing and I just wasn't that happy. So I found this other thing that makes me happy. That's an idol. 
And by the way, serving the Lord, there's nothing better than serving the Lord. Here you'll find some real joy. Serving the Lord. Alongside other believers, sharing your faith. No greater feeling than sharing your faith. And God's hand of power in your life as you do it. Okay, back to Ephesians. Ephesians. Talk about this armor. Ephesians chapter 6. It's all about standing. How are you going to stand? Or will you succumb to the devil's attacks like that? Will you be the Demas? Right now we're serving together, fellowshipping together in two years. Are we wandering back into the world? We should be aware. We think we stand, take heed lest we fall. Many Christians fallen. In the year 2024, I meet so many people, so many people who tell me, yeah, we, we used to be real faithful in church. Yeah, actually my dad was a pastor. Yeah, actually, oh yeah, I've done all that. Yeah, we did all the summer camp. Pro, we did the same thing, Christian camps. I grew up like you did. Oh yeah, we used to sing those songs. We used to read those passages. We, it's always past tense. As if somehow 2024 came around and the battle was over. We're just here now. The dust is settled. The battle's over. The battle's not over. The devil just lulled Christians to thinking that the battle's over. And he's taking over home after home after home after home. He's taking territory. City after city, state after state, nation after nation. The battle is still raging. We're going to need armor. Look at Ephesians 6, verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. The armor you need to keep standing. It begins with this belt of truth. The kids just sang about it. But friends, truth holds everything together. Truth holds everything. Like, I don't want to get too graphic here, but some of us, we need belts, myself included, or our pants don't stay up so well. He thinks to hold things up together. Truth does that. I was joking with the kids about this, some sloppy soldier going out in the battlefield. He's got all the armor, but none of it's staying up. It's all falling off. It's all loose and baggy. And belt of truth. Truth tightens things up. Holds all the armor in place. Truth is vitally important. Everything else is fake. It's like a cosplay outfit. It's like it's not really your armor. It's what you're, which what you're showing off. Truth. Truth. There's different areas of truth in your life, too. I, might, I think I will abbreviate this a little bit. But, you know, the truth, there's truth with God. You need to have an honest relationship with your God. Truth with God. Some of us play games with God like everything's okay and it's not okay. David told us in Psalm 51, 6, he said, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. You know, David messed up. We preached about that recently. He messed up terribly. And he could have kept faking it, faking it, faking his way through and probably fooled a lot of people. But when he's talking to God and he's confessing to God, he says, God, you see my heart. And you desire truth in the inward parts. It does no good if you're a wonderful actor. You know that? You might fool everybody the rest of your life that you are some on-fire Christian. But it does no good for God. He looks at your heart and he might at the end of your life give you a, an Emmy Award. But he's not going to give you any medals for serving the Lord. That you faked your way through it. God desires truth in the inward part. So when I talk about truth that holds your life together, it's getting real about you as viewed from the eyes of God. I'm not talking about you as viewed from the eyes of other people. How does God view you? What kind of person are you? God knows my deepest, darkest secrets. He knows everything about me. When I stand before God and I think about that, I meditate on that long enough, boy, I get all kinds of things to pray about. I get all kinds of things to both confess and ask for strength for. Lord, I, I don't want to be that person anymore. Nobody knows that about me but you, but I don't want to do that. Right. Truth, getting honest with your God. And then, it's, then there's honesty with God's Word. You know, a lot of us, we're very creative. 
and there's a lot of things to do in here and not do in this book. And somehow, we, we get some suggestions from the devil, I know, but we take the things in this book and somehow we say, well, it doesn't really apply to me. It doesn't really mean what it means. I'm the exception to that rule. That's for other people, not for me. If we go really bad, we get like the world, we start saying we can't even trust the book. And then no hope for you if you can't even trust the book. If you're going to say, well, it's been interpreted so many times, well, then just give up. You're going to be good for nothing if that's how you view the Bible. You're going to pick and choose what you can believe. No, we have a preserved Bible for us, and we should get honest with it. 2 Corinthians 4, 2 says, But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. You know Christians can do this? We can, we can be like, we can go right to somebody, share them a truth from God's word, but no, this is the truth, brother. You need to believe it. Christ is the Savior, right? Oh, but this passage over here, this part, I don't like that part either, so it's not really true. I'm not going to live that out. It's, it's, it's picking and choosing. You can't do that with the Bible. It says it, it says it. You've got to wrestle with it. There's tough rules in here. Rules about marriage being until death. Rules about the home and how it should be structured. Rules about church and being faithful to it. There's hard rules. We shouldn't be deceitful about it. We shouldn't be deceitful about it. Check yourself on that. Some, some Christians I know, some, and some of the men I've talked to, who tell me they used to be faithful. Lots of times they'll also spread in some line of, you know, that's what I used to think it said, but you know, I'm not so sure anymore. Truth with others. I've talked about this a little bit, but this belt of truth that's going to hold you together, you're honest with God, honest with God's Word, honest with others, it helps Bolton uh, tighten things up in your relationships, in your ability to serve with one another if you're honest about yourself, right? Your vulnerabilities, your weaknesses, maybe your strengths. It's about like, th think about going on a battlefield with somebody next to you, this brother in arms. And I, I was never in the military, so I can't speak to this very well, but I watch movies, okay? And all movies are true, I know that. But a brother in arms, it probably would, would help to know that brother, what he's good at, what he's not good at, right? I mean, this guy, he's a, he's a great sniper, okay? Or this guy, he's not very fast, so we're going to run over there, and he's really slow, or I'm really slow. Be open about we're weak weaknesses, honest with each other, if we fake like we're all Superman, we've got no problems, it just makes for a recipe for disaster as we go out in this battlefield. We're not playing to each other's strengths, we're not praying for each other's weaknesses, because we just fake it, like we got everything covered. We're doing just fine. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.25, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Okay, we're getting honest and more honest. We're now honest with God. Now we can be honest with our spouse. We can be honest with our pastors, honest with our brothers and sisters. Honest. It'll tighten up your relationship. Truth holds things together, brings things together. It holds things together. Fake things fall apart. It's like a fake belt, not doing any good. Fake suspenders, they're not holding anything up. Truth holds things together. Fake relationships, fake causes, fake ministries, fake churches, fake Christian homes, they all fall apart. Let's get real about who we are. If it's not where it should be, then we can remedy. Ask God to make us stronger, make us real. The last one for truth, and I've hit around this the whole time, but truth with God, truth with God's Word, truth with others, truth with ourselves. It's, it's very related to lying to God, but truth with ourselves, sometimes we can deceive ourselves. You know, it actually says that, 1 John 1, 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That 1 John, we studied it recently, about the Christian getting right. Christians, we can deceive ourselves. I'm doing just fine. The pastor up there you know, yelling about people not serving the Lord. I'm doing just fine. What is he talking about? We can deceive ourselves. We can be a demon that's completely been living in the world for a couple years or more and think everything's just cool. Don't deceive yourself. Be honest with yourself. Outside of God, you know yourself better than anyone else. Be honest. Where are you at with the Lord? Why are you on this battlefield? Are you serving the Lord? Really? No, really. Are you? Are you contending for the faith? 
Or do we just argue about everything else? I know a lot of Christians who contend, but they don't contend for the faith. They contend for politics. They contend for best football team. They contend for best way to make a thousand bucks. I don't know. They fight, they argue, but not about the things that really matter in this world. Spiritual battles. 14 also says, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. I'm not going to go to this passage for the sake of time, but friends, the breastplate of righteousness, it, it speaks to righteous living. There's a lot, of, lot in this book about how Christians go into sin. The breastplate of righteousness is righteous living. It's living right. It's not going by sin, not even passing by it, not even touching it. By about the time a Christian starts dabbling in sin, sins of the eyes, sins of the flesh, sins of the mind, when we start dabbling in sin, we are just taking off that breastplate and making our hearts so vulnerable to, cuss, to be attacked by the devil, to be destroyed by the devil. What brings a Christian down truly are not the devil's lies by themselves, but it's the devil's lies that get us off into sin. Doing things we shouldn't do. Nothing will bring a Christian down faster than a Christian going into sin. Protect your heart with this breastplate of righteousness. Remind yourself. Stay out of sin. Teach yourself. This whole book is all about that. It's, it's great at defining sins. It's great at, at, at ways to stay out of sin. Right? Leaning on brothers. Hold you accountable. Sisters to hold you accountable. Memorizing these scriptures. Keeping them in your heart. They might not sin against thee. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Get so much Bible in here that tells you how evil sin is that you don't want to touch it. That's that breastplate of righteousness. Christians staying right. What will destroy a Christian is sin. It will bring you to your knees one way or the other. Sin will. It says here in verse 15, and if you want to learn more on that, you're taking notes, read through Proverbs chapter 4. It'll talk about staying away from sin. Proverbs chapter 4. Now look at verse 15. It says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. These are the shoes we wear. It's vital for what you're going to do that day, isn't it? It's summer camp. I mean, we're going to be out in the woods hiking. We're out on these fields going through mud. I would not, if, I, if someone shows up, you know, if my wife shows up in some fancy church heels or something, she's not ready for the day, right? It's like camping. Sometimes we go camping up in the, in the blues and we go hiking. You better have a good pair of hiking shoes or your feet are going to tell you you got the wrong shoes after a couple hours. Prepared. This preparation, it, what you put on your feet describes what you're going to do that day. The best thing to have on your feet every day, and you put them on, is this gospel of peace. It's a reminder about what you're all about. Meditating on the gospel is powerful. It's grounding. When you think on the gospel, what Jesus Christ did for you, how you didn't deserve it, but he shed his blood. He washed your sins away, gave you a home in heaven. That kind of love he had for you, it's grounding. You get your feet back on the ground when you think about the gospel. You're like, no, I'm not going to live over there on that path. I'm not going to wander over that way. My purpose is not over there, and it's not over there. My purpose is right here. God saved me. I'm going to serve him. The gospel is grounding. Get you right where you're supposed to be. And by the way, I just spoke to it, but the gospel, you meditate on the gospel, it gives you purpose for every single day. You've got a message to share with those feet. And how beautiful are the feet of them that share the gospel of peace, the Bible tells us. It does not hurt. You may as a Christian, I hope, it, I hope it's not true, but as Christians, if we begin to yawn about the gospel, something's wrong with us. The gospel, as we meditate in it, every time it should bring us back down to earth about what really matters. What's really important. 
I've never regretted reading back through the Gospels and reading through the crucifixion scene or reading Isaiah 53 or anything about Christ. It always helps me. Always helps me. Prepares me for my day, for my week, for my month, for my year. Put on your feet the gospel of peace. And if you're not wearing those shoes, you're wearing flip-flops in this battle, you're, gonna, you're in to get hurt. You're in for an injury. Suit up. Get the right shoes on. It's all about the gospel. It'll ground you. It'll give you some feet and some purpose for those feet. Look at verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The shield of faith. It says, above all, take this armor, this shield of faith. This is this piece that can move as the devil attacks with all kinds of attacks. I mean, all kinds. These fiery darts, these are all kinds of lies. These are all kinds of statements, attacks about uh, who you are, what you can do, how you can exist. These are lies like you can't believe this book. That, that's a fiery dart. Lies like uh, you don't have enough money. You've got to focus on money. Lies like you can't speak the truth. You can't stand on this alone. You need the world. You don't have enough. You are not enough with God's strength. Lies like you're going under, so freak out. Do something drastic. Your health's not good enough. Your church is no good. Got to be a better church over that way somewhere else. There's no good church anywhere, so just stop going. The Bible's not true. Well, nobody loves you. Nobody appreciates you. You know who puts those thoughts in your head? It's the devil. The devil, I think, is good at making Christians a bunch of Eeyores. I watched that episode the other day. Nobody remembered my birthday. I think Eeyore probably went to a Baptist church somewhere. <laughs> the devil's good at planting those thoughts like no one gives a darn about you. It's not true. It's not true. Christians are for you. Christians love you. Any Christian worth their salt loves other Christians. Wants them, wants them, wants what's best for them. Wants them to succeed and thrive. Don't listen to the devil. Hold up the shield of faith. Luke 12, if we had more time, we'd read it, but we don't. Luke 12 is all about, all about not doubting, right? Christ tells us we don't have to doubt. If God took care of the lilies of the valley, he'll so clothe us, right? Oh, ye of little faith, he says. Let's not doubt. Remember, doubts turn into disobedience. 17, we're almost done. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This helmet of salvation, it's very much, uh, in some ways, it's tied, I believe, the gospel of peace. But whereas the gospel of peace on our feet, it gives us action and purpose for every day and grounds us, this helmet of salvation that you take on, it's not that you're getting saved every day you put it on, but it's this great hope that you have when you remember at the top of your mind that you are saved. And it allows you to march into battlefields, I think, with great confidence. March into dark valleys with great confidence when you know at the end of the day you are born again. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, and 9 says, it says, And for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Just keep that in the front of your mind. The hope. It's the hope helmet. The helmet of salvation. You've got nothing to fear. You've got the victory at the end of the day. You're on the right side. You've got a God that loves you thanks to the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. There's a lot of hope. That's hope for every day. You wake up hopeless. Some, some days it is. It's, it's easy to wake up. Well, not easy, but it's possible to wake up days and be hopeless. Put that helmet of salvation on. You realize that while this life has hardship, it has ups and it has many downs, it has sorrows because of sin, death by sin, all kinds of problems in this world. We put on that hope of salvation and get your mind thinking about what's ahead for you. You got heaven to come. Your Savior to see. 
eternity to live with, with fellow believers in the Lamb of God. All kinds of reason to be hopeful. Even on the darkest day, all re kinds of reason to be hopeful. The last, ver last piece of this armor here is the sword of the Spirit. And it tells us very plainly what it is. It is the Word of God. That's how you fight back. Our church, sometimes people tell us, well, we're too confrontational. Well, <laughs> I simply believe that it's great to be armored. That protects you. But you know what getting active with your sword does? It can protect others. The little ones around you, your, your loved ones around you, they may not be fully armored right now. And it would be nice if you just took that lie out, pointed out for what it is. You said that's destructive, that's not a thing of God, that's a lie from the devil right there. I want to point it out. I'll refute it with the word of God. I'll show you, no, this verse says that's wrong. This verse says that's wrong. The sword is where we can start helping others, really, wielding this sword. We know what the Bible says on that. Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Bible is a supernatural book. It is true, and it cuts through lies. It cuts through lies in this world. It even cuts through some of the lies we have rolling through our own heads. Let us be Christians who put on the full armor of God. And with that full armor, let us stand plainly on the battlefield. I don't know what's worse. Well, I think I know what's worse. <laughs> Some Christians aren't on the battlefield at all. And so they're not wearing the armor. And frankly, they probably don't need it because they're not much of a target. The devil's like, that guy's sitting over there doing nothing, so they don't need the armor. What I encourage us to be is get on the battlefield. And then armor up. Be prepared. With your feet, the gospel of peace, breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, and all bolstered together by a firm understanding of reality, of what is true. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, help us to be good soldiers for Jesus Christ, Lord. There, are, there is a battle. There's spiritual warfare. Help us not to take it lightly. The battle's still raging. Help us to be prepared for the battle, ready for the battle, Lord, dressed as we ought in the armor of God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.